What's going on, guys? Sensible Prepper Live, and we're going to be doing a prepper school. Uh, Robbie's not here today, uh, and so it's going to just be me. But we're going to talk about something to me that is it's very interesting, especially thinking this through. You know, one of the things about being a prepper is you try to, you know, organize your thoughts. You try to have a plan. If you're not careful, you're just continually buying stuff. And so we're going to go through some things that I think will help you to think about things. You know, what's going to happen? Uh, one of the things that happened during COVID was all of a sudden we had to make a lot of decisions. And the more prepared you were, the more you could kind of relax a little bit. For those who had no preparations and thinking about lockdowns, it was time for panic. And that's why we saw a lot of things just disappear off the shelf. Of course, including the infamous toilet paper shortage, which is rough for everyone. So we're going to go through some, some different scenarios. Mainly, we're going to talk about certain places uh, according to utilities and how that affects our lives on an everyday um, way. And we want to make sure that we, we kind of plan ahead. We think about things. We have maybe some alternates already kind of set aside. That's the big thing today. Uh, before we get started, though, we want to talk about Exotac. And, you know, one of the things about fire starting is that it is the number one really element of survival, because one of the big things about starting a fire is that you can boil your water, you can cook your food, it gives you light, it gives you warmth, uh, it keeps predators at bay. And so it's very important to have a way to start fire. Uh, and honestly, for me, I always recommend having a fire kit not just Bic lighters. I mean, that's the most convenient way, the way I use things, even matches, but having some ways that are long-term that you can continue to make fire if you need to. And Exotac gives a 20% discount using Such20 with the link down below in the description. And we really appreciate Exotac for sponsoring today's episode. They are my favorite fire starters. So, Sarah Max over on the computer. And if you have any kind of questions, you know, anytime you can um, send them in and leave it in the comments and then she'll, we'll take a break and she'll go through some of the questions that we can get to. So let's talk about utilities. Now, a lot of times, you know, like in a storm, you have your power go out, but typically you still have water. You still have maybe propane or if you have a natural gas, things like that, that heat your home. Uh, you know, we have the internet, we have cell phone, we have these things. So this is going a step farther. Uh, one thing that happened recently, I saw a, a video about a, uh, a guy that had a sheriff of a county and not a very big county. It was a county in Ohio. And he talked about all the cyber attacks that they get on a daily basis. And this is just an obscure county. Uh, and it has affected them at times. One time it knocked out their dispatch. Uh, they've had other issues. Uh, so they had to go to paper and they had to make some changes. This And guys, the thing is, the whole country, uh, whether it's local government or federal government, is under cyber attack. Uh, and, you know, there are different players, some for just profit, some actually national players, uh, China, Russia, Iran. Uh, and they're sending out all these attacks and sometimes they work. And so, you know, that is one of the threats right up front. Now, will that affect all of our utilities? Probably not, but it definitely will get you. If you have preparations for any of these being knocked out, it's just going to put you a, a little bit ahead. Also a terrorist type activity. Uh, we saw in Moscow just recently where they were um, had an attack at a theater killed over 130 people, and this is ISIS, and they've vowed to do similar attacks here in the U.S. With an open border, just makes it a little bit easier. And so, you know, there are threats. This isn't doom and gloom, guys. These are actual true threats that are happening. Uh, we have groups, nefarious groups in this country, um, and some have even tried to go to, you know, poison water or affect our water supply. Uh, you know, they could affect uh, utilities, power. Uh, one thing that they're really good about is going to a substation and just shooting it up. And this can affect power for thousands of people. Uh, and then we have an EMP possibility, uh, which, you know, that would be more serious and it would knock out our, our electrical power, which would knock out all of our utilities. Uh, and, and these kind of things, guys, while they are somewhat remote, uh, they can happen. And if they do, it's going to have devastating effects. 
uh, and then go to war. If we happen to have a war, uh, there can be a lot of different type attacks, not just, you know, physical attacks, but again, cyber and EMP type attacks, nuclear, things like that. They can knock out large sections of the country and knock out our utilities or poison the water, or there's a lot of different things. And then there's just natural disasters that happen. And, um, and even the bridge that was hit by that boat, that uh, cargo ship, uh, you know, it is going to have a huge effect uh, overall on the Northeast because it's in one of the major ports. So, guys, there's a lot of little things that happen all around that can cause uh, disruptions in our utilities. But we're going to talk about each of the different utilities that we pay and why you need to think about these ahead of time. Uh, first off is power, uh, electricity. And obviously, you know, we need the lights on. You know, we need the stove working. We need the um, wash machine going. Now, some of you guys have propane uh, or you have different methods, but even cleaning the house, vacuuming, um, you know, there's just a number of different things that we do on a daily basis using cordless tools, whether it's cordless drills or saws. Uh, a lot of times we depend on them. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, dependence on power. You know, one of the big things, too, that's really another threat or a cause is uh, infrastructure. The more people that come come into our country that pour across the border, uh, you know, and it's millions, it does affect our infrastructure, not only traffic and, you know, housing and things like that, but it puts a strain on the electrical system, on the water supply, uh, on natural resources. And so it's almost like it's this multi-pronged threat effect. And we need just to kind of consider it and we need to kind of start planning ahead of time. Let's just take power, for instance. If the power goes out, how are you going to purchase anything? You know, what are you going to do? You know, right now, the price of gold is at an all-time record high. I mean, way above what it's ever been in the history, in our history. Uh, at least when we're gauging the price of gold, it is over $2,200, right at $2,200 an ounce. You know, that is absolutely crazy. I'll just, I mean, it's just crazy. And silver has kind of kept its, you know, it's, it's kept its value down to a certain amount. Um, I highly recommend having some. I'm not saying you invest all of your money into into gold or silver. It's not really an investment as much as it is uh, it protects your wealth. If the ATMs go out and we go into cash, which cash is also something that's important to hold back. The problem right now, especially with cash, is inflation is bringing the value down. So gold kind of helps even that out or silver. And so it just allows you to be able to have some uh, a commodity that's been around since the beginning of time. Uh, since man discovered gold and silver, it has been uh, used for currency. And I know I get a lot of people, uh, and I, I say a lot, it's probably just a few people in the comments. And a lot of times, again, it's, well, I've got my precious metals. They're steel, brass, and lead. Uh, you know, I understand that. And you probably don't have me beat on that. But I still put gold, silver back, precious metals, and we put cash back. Because if we need supplies and maybe the store doesn't have an ATM, maybe they don't have power, but sooner or later, they're going to just say, we've got all this stuff in here. Let's see if we can, we can sell it or we can market it or trade or barter or do things like that. So that's an extreme, but that's something I think that should be on your playbook. It's something that, you know, there should be some contingency that if you really need supplies or you need things, that's going to be a big plus, especially if ATMs are down or hacked. How many times have you been into a business and they've said, oh, the Internet, you know, the uh, our machines are down. And, you know, if you have cash, you can have lunch. If you don't, you don't. Um, OK, so heating and air. Heating and air is a big one. You know, the uh, HVAC, it's a big deal. It's heating and air. If that goes down, what are your alternate sources? Um, of course, you know, uh, wood stoves are one of the best. Uh, but if the AC goes down and you have propane that heat your home or natural gas, you know, you're in good shape there. But in total utility collapse, you're not going to have that as well. So heating and air, what is it that you have set aside in case it gets really cold? You know, in Texas a couple of years ago, 
uh, you know, they were really making a push for the green energy. There was a lot of wind turbines. There was a lot of uh, solar that they were trying to do. And the big ice storm came and it knocked out everything. And, you know, that can happen. Uh, and of course, right now we're getting ready to get into spring or we are into spring. And so that's not necessarily a problem now, but it's something that we could start planning for now for next winter. Guys, honestly, I think a lot of us already have contingency plans because the power does go out on occasion. And, and when it goes out in the middle of winter, it can be dangerous. Um, then we just things like washing your clothes, uh, things like lighting. What have you got this alternative for lighting? Uh, do you have a solar backup? Do you have candles? Do you have uh, lanterns with wicks, uh, you know, lights that you can uh, and then you have fuel set back? Uh, and you even then you're going to want to be very conservative because let's face it, guys, you can't supply enough candles to be able to replace the light that you have. And you'll need to be very conservative. Same thing with lanterns or, you know, gas type lanterns. Uh, but you're still dependent on fuel. Now, there are some alternate fuel sources and that's something. Of course, those have been around since the 1800s, well, even well beyond that. And so that's something, again, to go back and consider what people were using before electricity was invented. How were they getting along? What were they doing? And kind of learn some lessons from that. Um, cooking. Cooking's a big deal. Now, some of you go, well, we've got a gas grill. I'm going to go out and cook on the gas grill. That works fine until you run out of propane. So, you know, again, it needs to be something that is renewable. You know, for, to be honest with you, you could take a grill, um, a standard gas grill, propane grill, and you can put a fire in there and you can actually cook uh, on the grill if you had to. But do you have a way to cook? Uh, there's a lot of options out there. In fact, I took bricks, uh, just took some bricks and stacked them to where I had a, a vent hole down the middle and I can set a screen on it. I can cook on it. I put the fire, the uh, really just sticks, leaves biomass is what it's called. And you just take those things and feed into that fire. But it takes a lot of energy. And then you can cook. And there's a lot of options. There's rocket stoves. There's a lot of different things that really just require natural elements that you can find and then be able to use that. So that's a really good way to think about cooking. Uh, tools. Again, you, you know, your electric tools are going to be out. Do you have uh, the right screwdrivers? Do you have uh, the basic tools that you might need. One thing that Robbie and I both do is we buy mechanical tools, uh, you know, tools like I have a grinder and it's got a grinding wheel and the way it's set up, I can turn it and that wheel will zoom. And, you know, it's a lot more than the effort I'm putting into it. And there's a lot of other things that you can do like that that are just hand tools. And, you know, and they're cool and they're fun to collect drills, different kind of drills that you can use. So coming up with a few things if that's something that you're going to need, because really, again, when the power goes down, it goes down. Um, let's see, vacuuming. And one thing that's a, a plus for vacuuming is getting a broom and making sure you have brooms. Now, most of us have brooms. Most of us have some of this stuff. It's just thinking ahead and making sure that we don't have any holes in those things. Uh, but uh, really, we're going well away from a cash society. And because of that, and cash can be inconvenient. Uh, you're ever going to the grocery store and you're standing behind some little old lady and she's picking through her, her purse and, you know, getting the right change. And you're like, come on, lady, it's not, <laughs> let's get things moving. But, you know, really, I got to the point where I would look at that and I would think, well, thank goodness people are still using cash because cash is, you know, legal tender and it's something that we should have. Um, solar, solar works good. Uh, you know, if you have a good sunny day, uh, there's some different methods. Uh, there's solar generators. There's solar battery backups. There's solar power backups. There, there's a lot with solar. Solar is very limited, but you know you can use it to be able to, in, in a pinch if there's no electricity, and you know you can go for a long time. The one thing about solar on the long term is that sooner or later your battery, whatever that solar panel is charging, is going to have to be replaced. You know, it's funny to me, I see all these electric cars going down the road and they're really cool, actually. And I, we have a place right up here where they uh, have a hookup and there's, you know, a bunch of mainly Teslas. They're just a row of Teslas. But when that battery has to be replaced, you know, it's $10,000 or whatever. I, don't, I haven't priced it, but it's, it's very expensive. 
And sooner or later, it will need to be replaced, just like the battery in your car. So while solar is great and you have battery and you can charge something that can give you some electricity and some power, in the long-term scheme of things, it's going to be limited sooner or later. It's one good thing to kind of have some plans to back that up in the long run. And guys, you know, the thing is, is SHTF, that can be a local event. It can be a temporary event. It can be something that happens. Or as an EMP would occur, it could be a long-term event. So one of those things, again, to kind of plan ahead. Um, all right. Next is water. Well, let me, I missed one. Uh, in fact, I just saw it on the board. Uh, one thing is, is like washing clothes. Hygiene is very important and it's going to be important, especially in this next one with water. Uh, you know, hygiene, keeping your clothes clean, you know, is going to be an important thing. And if you don't have a wash machine, which you're going to need electricity and water. Um, one thing that's great to have is a washboard to be able to get your clothes as clean as you can. And there are some ways to be able to clean it. Of course, detergent, you can only have so much. But if the power goes out and you have a good supply of detergent, it's going to put you in good shape. But keeping your clothes clean uh, is going to help them to last longer. And having clothes lined with clothes pins to be able to hang clothes up to dry. Uh, water. Water is probably one of the um, is one of the most important parts of this whole deal. Uh, water supplies are directly connected to the internet. I mean, to the internet. Yeah, to the internet. They're they're co they're connected to uh, systems, computerized systems that run those efficiently, and it's great. It's a wonderful thing while it's working. Just like the power, the grid is all computerized, so it's very vulnerable to certain attacks. So with the water supply. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things. We drink water. I mean, you know, we bathe in water. It has, uh, our gardens need to be watered. So taking some ideas like gardening. I mean, a lot of times I don't really think about uh, an irrigation system for my garden because I've got rain barrels and that's one of the solutions is having some rain barrels. Even if you're not drinking from them, at least you're using them to be able to water your garden. Plus it cuts down on the water bill. And kind of conserves water that way. Uh, but having rain catchment systems, uh, you know, having a, a lake or a pond uh, somewhere close, identifying that place. But the problem is, whether it's rainwater or uh, these ponds, is you're going to need to filter it. Uh, one of the big problems with rainwater is rainwater typically is fresh. You can drink it. But the problem is, is that it is on the roof and it goes through your gutter system. And typically there's a lot of things it can pick up. So you're going to have to be careful and you're going to have to take care of your water. Uh, there is also boiling water. Uh, you build a good fire. You can boil your water. Make sure that you have a large enough pot that if you're going to take the time to boil that water, you're not doing it in small increments. Boil your water, get it fresh, clean, and you can store it. Um, and so that also takes firewood, it takes things like that to be able to uh, filter that water or to clean that water. Now, one of the things about boiling water or um, uh, even when you um, uh, dip, pull water out of a stream is that it is it needs to be um, cleaned. It needs to be tested and, you know, or not tested, but there's somebody standing out here. I can hear them. So I'm getting a little bit distracted. Sorry. Uh, but let's get back to boiling. Boiling water, you know, you don't remove your sediment. You don't remove the taste or the smell. Uh, and so you'll need to strain through it. And it's just going to be what it is. You're going to have to have water. And the rule of threes, you can only, only live three days without water. So having water is going to be really vital. If you have a creek or a stream, uh, you know, or even again, a water catchment system, there's going to be some processes you need to keep that clean. You can get cryptosporidium or giardia, which can not only make you super sick, but it can also kill you. Uh, it can make you dehydrated. So being careful not to just reach into a stream, get a bucket of water and start drinking. Another thing about water is your toilet system. Uh, you know, it's not on an electric system. And so you can actually take water, go into your house, fill up the bowl and you can flush the toilet. And so that's one way because hygiene is going to be very important. Taking a bath. How are you going to take a bath? You know, there are some solar uh, shower setups that you can use. The camping world is an excellent resource for a lot of different things, even toilets uh, where you can use outdoor toilets. So it gives you just some options. And there are some ways to make toilets. But that's one thing that's going to be a big deal is waste and sanitation and your garbage. But waste in particular, it can be very dangerous if it's not handled properly. 
So water, not only drinking water, it's also about hygiene. It's also about keeping your garden going and you need to have some, some sources tied down for water. Uh, one thing obviously we do is rain catchment systems and we have some of the blue barrels and we have the gutters hooked up to it. And so we have potable water right there, uh, but we still, again, need to, to strain it and to filter it uh, just because we're not sure where it's coming from. And there are other methods to be able to process water. And, you know, the old method of, of sand and charcoal and grass and, you know, setting up levels where it'll come through. Uh, that is also an option. So water, guys, super important, vital to survival, and it's something that we need to think about. We're going to talk about, we're going to get into this next one, and then we're going to take some questions. Um, let's look at um, gasoline. Gasoline uh, is not the most stable. It's got a short shelf life. Uh, if you use fuel stable, you know, you can usually keep it and extend the life of it. But to be honest, gasoline is not one of the best to store, but it's something that we probably use as much as anything. Uh, whether it's your vehicles, transportation is definitely the big plus here. Uh, and tillers, if you're building a, making a garden. So if you don't have gasoline, you're going to have to have alternate ways to be able to get your ground prepared for gardening. Uh, if you don't have a vehicle, you need to have a bicycle. Uh, you may need to have a cart or, you know, even horses, horses, mules, donkeys, they can carry carts. That's a lot of trouble, especially if you're in an urban or suburban environment. But that's going to be one option that people are going to use. Even a scooter, uh, one of the push scooters or a skateboard, it's going to help you to get from point A to point B a lot quicker than just your feet. The other side of that is with your feet for transportation is you're going to wear your shoes out. So maybe having a couple of extra pair of shoes. Uh, and I know the women would really love that. <laughs> but us guys are just as bad. So there's a number of different things uh, with gasoline that we depend on. And guys, to be honest with you, with the current administration really and, and an attack on fossil fuels, um, you know, we're losing more and more of our options with that. And the problem is with the solar side and batteries and all that stuff, that's we're even going to be more vulnerable. So just some options about what to do about gasoline, but even more importantly, about transportation. Let's go to some questions. Um, Tyler asked questions. Should we be stocking up on antibiotics for SHTF and what is the best way to get them? Well, there, you know, there's a lot of, of, of talk about that. There's a lot of natural antibiotics, uh, one that we've used for years. And I'm not recommending this because I'm not a medical doctor, YouTube, because they don't like when you do this. Uh, we use colloidal silver and we use it very effectively. And we have for years and uh, you can make it at home. Uh, you know, all you need is a silver, uh, some pure silver and a, a way to hook it up to electricity. And, and you can look it up on YouTube. That is one of the probably the our, one of our go-to antibiotic sources uh, and they've used it. They still use it in the medical fields, especially for treating burns and things like that. But uh, there are some natural remedies out there, but it's going to take a lot of research. Uh, there are sources where some of the pet meds, the pet antibiotics uh, are actually made on the same lines for human antibiotics. The problem with antibiotics though, is that you may be resistant to it. It may not be what affects what you're trying to treat. Antibiotics, that's a big world. And so really, uh, you know, antibiotics are going to be one of those things to where, you know, you're going to have to have some knowledge and be able to research. So if you're concerned about it, you know, books like Where There Are No Doctors or, you know, different type home remedies and medical remedies, uh, homeopathic type remedies. I would start to get into some of that stuff. One thing with our prepper group is my wife's a nurse. And she was a labor and delivery nurse for 20 years, but she's all into the natural remedies. And we have another doctor that is part of our group. And we have another nurse. I mean, we have some medical, we have medical really in good shape and really having somebody that, you know, that you can that talk to that's interested in that can really help you a lot when it comes to those things. But cleanliness is going to be one of the most important parts of keeping that wound or whatever, or the sickness that you have. Obviously, you can't really keep that clean. But to me, uh, and you can actually order a lot of, of antibiotics and different medications. Uh, you can have them sent from other places in the, in the world. <laughs> that works too. Uh, Nick Howard asked, 
Hello from South Florida. Do you recommend ice packs or ice cubes for a roto molded cooler that's approximately 20 to 26 quarts? Looking for it to keep beverages cool for a weekend in Florida heat. Yeah, Florida heat's kind of tough already. Uh, ice packs will definitely work well, work better than a lot of things. Um, and according to actually how good your cooler is, you know, that's that's a big deal as well. So, um, you know, we have Yeti coolers and um, and they keep keep things really cold. Uh, I do have a um, one of the big soft and I can't remember the name of it now, but it's one of the big soft coolers and it'll keep ice. And they tested it in South Florida. And I think it's like it'll keep ice ice for like 36 hours. It's pretty cool. Um, so I can't remember the name of it, but there are some coolers. I would just look up the specs and what they offer. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube that talks about it, uh, especially coolers, because that's a big deal for, for a lot of people, you know, just going to the lake. And so doing some research there. But yeah, ice packs tend to be really good because they're solid. They, they tend to not dump water everywhere when they melt. Um, ice cubes and uh, bagged ice, you know, it melts pretty quickly. Uh, Chris Matthews says, Mr. Don, would you consider doing an updated vehicle setup and or organizational in general? Hope all is well. Hey, Chris. Um, Chris is local here. Uh, they, uh, yeah, you know, the thing is, especially with uh, vehicle setups, uh, you know, and we did one on, you know, I just have a, I have a Jeep and uh, it's a Wrangler and just kind of set it up to see what it would be like for a bug out situation. And you run out of room really quickly, um, especially if you have more than one person. Uh, you know, to me, having a setup uh, with multiple people, you're really going to have to step outside the vehicle with, you know, tents and things like that, uh, hammocks. But um, overall, yeah, I need to look at maybe doing something with a little bit larger vehicle. We have a Yukon and we can do some things with it. But I'll just be honest with you guys. When you're, you're talking about bugging out, uh, you need to have a huge enclosed trailer or a big camper and just load that thing down <laughs> because, you know, you are not going to go far, you know, in a, just in a vehicle, uh, especially not on foot with carrying just a bug out bag. But setting your vehicle up and having the necessary supplies in there, uh, especially food, food's going to be a big one. If you have to get on the road, uh, but if it's just a setup for some light SHTF situations, uh, but you want to have all the rule of threes covered. But yeah, that, that should be a good one to kind of come back to because, uh, and two, one thing that I've been thinking about is the necessary items that you need in your car at all times um, to kind of, you know, head off any kind of problems. Because let's face it, guys, you know, you can have a personal SHTF that doesn't affect anyone else but you. And when you have all your supplies in your vehicle, it's amazing, amazing how that works. We were at the range the other day shooting and uh, doing my, my suits channel. And so it started raining and it wasn't supposed to rain. It wasn't a heavy rain. It was just a mist, but my cameras were getting covered. The guns were getting covered in rain in this mist. And I went, ah, I've got some stuff in the car. So went back, have it, had an umbrella, which I don't even use umbrellas, but we had an umbrella for some reason in the back. And then I got my go bag and I pulled out a tarp and I was able to cover everything without having to put everything up. And it's amazing when you have preparations ahead, like paracord and just, different items, uh, even fire starting tools. Uh, you have those items in your vehicle. Uh, if something were to happen, you can go right to your vehicle and there's those items. So it's a great, just a really smart thing to have certain items in your vehicle for emergencies, because I'm telling you, you will end up using them. Maybe not the whole thing, but you'll end up using parts. Um, Robin NVA asks, how do you feel about the name brand Sun Ovens? Are they, are there decent, less expensive ones? Yeah, there are some, uh, you know, the thing is, is typically with name brands, uh, they, and with popular brands, you know, they've gained a reputation. One thing that I always do is look into the reviews and I don't look at the glowing reviews because a lot of people get things and for the first time they open it up and they go, Oh, this is awesome. Great. They've not even used it. So I would look more toward the midsection reviews. Typically, you've got more information about it, you know, where, oh, the hinge came loose here or this tore or when I got it, it didn't have this. And if you see a lot of that, you know, to steer clear from those products. But um, to me, typically, I find that I have better success when I buy quality products. Whether it's a knife, whether it's a flashlight, 
uh, whatever it is, I tend to have better success with good quality products. And when we're talking about something that you could depend your life on, you want it to be pretty solid. That's a very important part about it. So um, again, do your research on some of these different ones. And I'll tell you, I, we were buying a zero turn lawnmower recently or a couple of years ago now. And I started doing checking reviews and doing stuff. And I had one kind of in mind and found out quickly that that was not the right choice. Uh, so, you know, sometimes the name brands can stick in your mind, but going to reviews and looking at that, and you should do that with all your products, just like the Exotag products. You know, I love these things. Do your, do your research, do your due, due diligence and check it out. We're going to add one more and then we're going to jump back into the, the list. Okay. Um, these are kind of similar questions. So I'm going to ask both of them. John Lance asks, any experience with solar powered wells? And then Boxer Papa says, Don, this is Don in Central Florida. Any thoughts on hand pump for a well or is solar power possible? What's up, Don? Um, yeah. One thing about it, yes, yeah, solar powered wells do work. Uh, if, but, you know, again, you are dependent on the sun. Now, in central Florida, you shouldn't have too much trouble uh, unless you have a hurricane coming through. But, um, you know, there are different ways. I, you know, Scott Hunt at Engineer 775, he does a lot with solar. And he started out being the uh, doomsday prepper. He was the guy that analyzed each prepper. And he was actually on the first prepping. And he lives near me. He's a good friend of mine. He is a genius when it comes to setting up different systems. In fact, one of my best buds, um, he went up and put a hand pump on his well. Uh, and it's great. And then actually not only put a hand pump, but diverted the water right to his sink. So he can flip a switch and pump and get water in his sink, which is you know a great way to do it. Uh, so, yeah, solar uh, from what I understand, I mean, you know, if you, and, and two is according to how deep the well is. Sometimes there are wells that are pretty deep that take a lot more power. So, you know, I would, I would look at that, but having, well, in central Florida, and I know that's one of you guys, uh, you know, the water table should be a lot more shallow than it is for a lot of us, especially those in the mountains. So, um, but yeah, solar, I would look at solar power. I would also look at hand pumps and look to see which one is the best for you. Because again, it is according to your situation, but having a backup for your well is very important. When we lived up in um, North Carolina, uh, our well was hooked up directly to the, to the power. So as soon as we had a power loss, we had a water loss and that's a double whammy uh, for here where I, we live now. Um, you know, we do have wa alternate water sources, but our water source, if the power goes out, we still have water because it's a municipal water system. Okay, let's let's continue to go. And I hope I answered your question. Um, now, let's talk about cell phones, communication. If electricity goes out, uh, you know, we're going to be without cell service. What does that mean? That is communication. That's the way that you get in touch with the people you love. It's the way you do business. It's the way, I mean, we all know it's it's vital to the society that we live in today. It's vital. Uh, and it's so convenient, so easy to pick up the phone and say, Hey, what's up? You know? And so, and it, we carry it in our hand. Not only is it the cell phone, but it's all the apps, all the different information that we get off of our cell phone. It's a mini computer. So if, if something happens to your cell phone and we're going to deal first with just communications, uh, you know, one of the things about it is to have a plan. If there is some kind of problem, let's say that all the power goes out and you have part of your family across town. You have no way to contact them. You're not really even sure exactly where they are. So you don't want to go try to find them and then they come home and you're not there. And then they go try to find you. You know, it's that crazy mindset of back and forth is to have locations um, of course, obviously, you know, your first home, your home should be your priority location to return to, um, you know, just getting home. I'm getting home. If I'm somewhere out of town and we have an EMP or something happens, uh, my whole mission is going to be to go home, uh, just like the book going home. And it's going to be I'm going to be hell bent to get home. So, number one, that is the, the primary source. Let's say that you get home and your place is compromised. There are looters in there or there's a 
somebody just decided to squat, which has been a national problem as well. Uh, they come and they take your home or something happens or the house burns down. Uh, you know, what is your alternate location? And so it's very important to have not only your plan A, which is your home, but have a plan B, which is outside the home where everybody goes to meet. Could be at a your brother's house. Could be, you know, somebody that lives close enough. Uh, could be somebody, you know, that you just have a designated place that that's where you go. Uh, and so really, that's the big thing. There's not really anything else you can do. The problem is if we have a complete power outage, or especially with an EMP, any kind of radios you have, or anything like that. Now, you may have some family radios. You may have uh, a way to be able to to talk to people for a limited time until those radios, the battery power runs out. One thing that I should have mentioned in, in power is to have backup batteries. Uh, make sure that you have enough batteries set back and that you rotate them out because that is going to give you some power for the short term uh, for lights and for radios and things like that. So uh, in power, batteries are an important part. With cell phones, though, it's communication completely. But here's the caveat. It's not just about communicating with your friends or getting in touch with your loved ones and making sure they're safe. It's about if you have a medical emergency, if you have a uh, fire emergency, if you have a criminal emergency where something's happening and you need to get in touch with, the, with law enforcement. Without communication, there's not a way to do that. So what do we do with that? Let's say that, and two, if there is a problem like that, they're probably going to be overwhelmed on top of that. So what do we do? Um, well, for one thing, again, just like the question earlier, uh, thinking about homeopathic ways, natural treatments, things that you can do. Guys, I'm telling you, with Big Pharma and all the garbage that they put into a lot of these things, you should be already looking into alternate ways to keep yourself healthy. Uh, it's, just, it's just better for your life. And but then once you get into that, then you can go to more of a uh, uh, a simple way, maybe just items that are around things that you can do to make things just better and to eat healthier. Uh, eating healthier is going to take you a long way. Guys, we eat so much crap. It's not even funny. Uh, but then it comes to police. You know, one big thing is going to be self-defense. You want to make sure that you can protect your home and you want to make sure you have the means to do so. And also with your family members. Guys, sometimes it's inconvenient. Load up, take them out, let them shoot, let them get comfortable. Start them out with a 22 pistol or 22 rifle and just let them shoot a little bit and then move them up in, in according to their age. And I start pretty early. All my kids started really early shooting. Uh, and so they become very accustomed to it. And so that's a very important not just having it, but then allowing them to experience it. So in case something happens, they're going to be have more confidence. Uh, but again, the guns and the ammunition. It's a very important part about defending your home because that's really where calling the police comes in. Uh, fire, having some tools there, your uh, smoke detectors. Uh, obviously, they're battery powered and they're going to last but only so long. But having fire extinguishers. Um, one thing that I got was a hero blanket. I think it was, it's from, um, it's a company that puts these fire blankets out and they put them in a pouch and you can hook them up right in your house or right in your kitchen or wherever you could have a fire and you can pull that blanket out and you can put it on top of a fire. It's made of fireproof material and it'll smother the fire. Uh, having a ladder in the upstairs bedrooms, uh, that uh, is one of those that just rolls up and you can just unroll it out and you can climb down. Uh, so there are some things about fire. Also, just checking out your electrical system, making sure that it's in good shape. And uh, now if it goes out, it goes out and you're not going to worry about it catching everything on fire. But if you have the, the essentials, because fire can be started by a lot of different ways, fuels, uh, lightning strike. I mean, there's a number of things that can happen uh, that when the power is even out. OK, so plan ahead. That's the big thing. When it comes to your cell phone, you've got to plan ahead and you've got to think it through. Uh, one thing that we've, uh, we're getting ready to do, uh, and this is a prepper group whole thing is we're going to have satellite radio, satellite phones, satellite phone. I keep saying satellite radio, satellite phones, uh, because satellites are well, 400 miles that actually you, you talk to that are for satellite radios. God, I'm going to say radio a hundred times, satellite phones. So it's a very important, um, it's, it's an alternate way to communicate. 
and it's not affected, even if the whole country is blacked out in power, you still have a way to be able to communicate. Uh, if someone else has some sort of way for you to communicate to them. And that's why we're going to get tandem. We're going to get so uh, these, um, um, what are we talking about? <laughs> these <laughs> satellite phones that we can connect to with different people uh, in our group. And so it gives us a way for communication. And there's also ham and, and all those things. But most of the time they rely on power unless you have a backup. And having backup systems, having battery backups, even for the short term, all the power goes out or all the utilities go out, it'll give you a short-term way to be able to communicate as long as you can uh, keep electricity going in those areas. And inverters, having solar panels with batteries, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do, especially in the short term. Long term, 10 years, you're going to be, you're going to be in the 1800s. Um, okay. One thing that we like to do, and I have it sitting over there, is an emergency radio. Uh, it, and it has solar and it has a hand crank. That's going to give me a lot of time uh, to be able to keep in communication. Uh, it does have short shortwave and shortwave sometimes reaches out farther. So, um, you know, it could be a way to have something to at least get information from. All right. The next is the Internet. And the Internet mainly is, of course, a way to communicate, but also to gather information. And if you want to find out what's going on, you know, the news, you're not going to know anything about what's happening around you. Uh, if all the power shut down, it's just going to be word of mouth. It's going to be Pony Express. I mean, it, you know, there's going to be some issues uh, without the Internet. And two, we'll probably have a lot of kids having meltdowns because they don't have their game systems anymore. But Internet, the information, the communication, the news, all those things are surrounded with the Internet. Uh, gasoline. Oh, well, we talked about gasoline. Uh, gas, which is in propane or natural gas. We have some good friends, and they have a natural gas generator. It's one of the big home genera generators. And as soon as the power goes out, this just kicks in. They, you know, in fact, we were talking about it. They don't even have a. They don't even see a difference. It's a very seamless change. What if the natural gas goes out? You know, there's propane to me is more stable for storage. Uh, one thing that we have done is we have bought a, quite a bit of propane because we can store it. It lasts for a long time in those containers and you can use it for different things. With natural gas, you have a flow coming to you that could be stopped. And propane, you can fire up your, your grill, your, your propane grill. Uh, you can run generators. There are certain generators that run on propane. Uh, you can have lighting. You can have heat. Uh, you know, Mr. Heater Buddy, those things are awesome. That's one thing I should have mentioned in uh, in the power is Mr. Heater Buddy. It takes propane canisters. Now, in the long term, sooner or later, those propane canisters uh, are going to run out. But one thing about propane, I think, is that it could possibly be one of the first that comes back uh, after a rebuild, uh, especially if we have a complete dissolve of all utilities. So I'm big about propane. I think it's just stable. It's, it's easy to store. It's safe. It's not, uh, you know, explosive like gasoline or other other fuels. And two, there are some other things like butane and uh, uh, different type heaters that you can get where you can store the cans. And that would probably be also a good option. Typically, they're very small. So that's the the thing is with propane and natural gas is you may that may be the way you cook. So having a source of wood having a way to heat that wood, you know, fireplace or even, you know, having a uh, some kind of stove that you can use outside. You got to be careful with using that kind of stuff inside because of the carbon monoxide. So you don't want to poison yourself. So making sure that you have a well ven ventilated area where you can cook. Um, and of course, generators run on propane. Uh, so having some propane step kind of set back to me is a, a good solution to keep you going longer. And there's just so many different um, things that you can do with propane that, that that have never been before. So propane to me, if the natural gas and propane run out, having a stock of it. And a lot of times you have a big tank, big 500 gallon, thousand gallon tank that sits out in your yard. And according to how full that is, it's going to give you some time and, you know, use it sparingly. All right. Let's go to some more questions. I'm going to throw, throw Sarah Mack under the bus. Uh, Colorado Biker asks, 
will you consider getting a still for water purification and other purposes? Yes, the other purposes, especially, but yeah, water, uh, that, that is a way to do it. And uh, setting up a steel, uh, I think you can even buy some steels. I think they have some set up. But yeah, distillery, distilled water, I think that's a good source, a good way to do it. It keeps it clean. It makes it drinkable. So, uh, and then two, on the other side of that, it gives you something to make just life a lot better. Um, and, you know, and really in a grid down situation, I think that having a steel, um, you know, would be a, uh, you'd, it'd make you the most popular person in the neighborhood. <laughs> Um, Silver Shire asks, do you recommend adding fractional type silver in your go bags, such as constitutional 90% dimes and quarters for barter? Yeah. Uh, now what I do is I, and I do, I, I think that uh, for me, the way I have it set up is I have a lot of dimes and quarters, half dollars. Uh, and then of course I do have silver dollars. Uh, and then I have the walking liberties. I try to, you know, have some of those, but to me, a, especially junk silver, uh, it is, it was currency and it still can be used as currency. You can throw it in a bunch of quarters and, you know, you can use it. But um, the, the fact is, is it's the silver content in it. People can identify, you know, if you have a, like a, a bullion and you have a bar, people are like, nah, I don't know. You know, what is that? Is that real silver? We used to have, a, my, you know, I grew up in the jewelry business. We did uh, custom jewelry, lost wax castings, and we bought a lot of gold and silver. At $350 an ounce, by the way. And one of the things that we had were testers. And so we would have to file off because people put really heavy gold plate on things. So, you know, there is some question. So to me, buying uh, junk silver especially uh, is just really smart. Uh, for me, for gold, I typically um, I buy ounces. Now, the one, pro the one reason I buy ounces is because, uh, and I don't always, sometimes I buy lesser. Uh, quantities, but price per ounce goes way up when you go into quarters or halves, half ounce, quarter ounce, tenth ounce, hundredth of an ounce of gold. You're paying a heck of a lot more. But let me just say this. Some of you guys are probably like me. You're watching the gold, the price of gold, and you're kind of going, man, I don't know. I mean, is this just going up? Is this just an anomaly? Is it just something that's happened? Or is this the lowest price it's going to be and it's going to continue to go up? And a good buddy of mine told me that last weekend, one of my Patreon members, and he said, I don't look at the price. Once a month, I just buy it. He goes, because I'm not buying it for an investment. I'm buying it for SHTF, economic collapse, whatever's going on. And, you know, I thought you're right. And so I went last week and I bought some silver and gold, uh, not even thinking about the price. Silver right now, though, is kind of staying in there, about $25 an ounce. So, um, guys, I'm telling you, and I'm, I've been saying this for a long time, and I feel more vindicated because you guys, gold is going through the roof. You need to, to invest in some precious metals. Uh, Bison asks, is um, acre gold worth it and legitimate? Yeah, acre gold's good. Acre gold, um, I, I kind of, I wasn't really working directly with them. I was working through uh, an, another guy, but um, I did do some things with acre gold and um and they seem very legit. Uh, they were very easy to work with. And that's important. Let me give you this, though. I have a good friend of mine. Uh, and of course, I love the acre gold because you can put it in smaller. In you know, you can pay a little bit along. But uh, I have a good friend of mine that has Scottsdale Mint. Josh at Scottsdale Mint in Scottsdale, Arizona. Highly trusted. Known him for like 14 years. And uh, they mint coins for over 20 countries. They are legitimately a mint and they have great programs and I love their coins. And one of the things I love the most is they have the lion of the tribe of Judah. They're not Jews, they're Christians, but they have the lion of the tribe of Judah stamped as their, uh, as their logo. And it's a really cool coin. And those guys are awesome to deal with. So I highly recommend Scottsdale Mint if you're looking for somebody that's really credible. There's a lot out there, but I just know Josh and those guys. Uh, Tony B just says, just making y'all aware that I had my wisdom teeth out yesterday and they no longer prescribe any antibiotics or pain relief, period. The instructions for pain, Motrin, and Tylenol here in Texas. Holy cow. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll just tell you a little short story. I, I had a tooth one time that, um, that I had, it was a wisdom tooth and they pulled it and they gave me drugs to, uh, you know, some pain relief. And 
I got home. I did. I went by the CVS to get my prescription filled and they were busy, super busy. So I just went home and my wife was there and I told her, I said, hey, would you mind going and getting this filled? Uh, because I'm probably going to need it. I was still feeling pretty good. Well, we got to talking and hanging out. And then next thing I know, all of a sudden sharp. I mean, it was unbearable, unfreaking bearable pain. So I can't even imagine that. That's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, that might have been good in the 1800s. And here's the thing, guys, with what we're looking at. If something like this were to happen, we would be right back in that situation of you having your teeth pulled with nothing. <laughs> Except maybe that steel. We're going to work on that steel project. Uh, Keelan asks, question, I'm considering storing a USB stick in some of my Faraday bags. Could you recommend any resources or PDFs I can download to it that if I can find a working computer would have would be good to have. There are a quite a few <clears throat> out there. I know Survival Dispatch used to do something. I don't know if they're still doing it or not, but they had a whole thing you could download. Um, Ultimate Survival. Uh, there's a number of different ones uh, out there. Uh, it's one thing I, I have not, and I need to. I need to download. And that was one of the things actually on my list that I overlooked. Uh, that is a great way. Now, the problem is, is are you going to be able to access that or at what point can you access it? Uh, the one thing is, even if you have a computer or a tablet that you can hook it up to solar, to some kind of battery backup and you can charge it and then you can check it out, you know. Uh, but one thing that I do, and really I didn't put this on the list, is I built a library of all kind of survival books. A lot of them are the fiction, you know, Going Home series, One Second After, uh, the Survivor series, which is excellent by James Wesley Rawls, but also reference books about where there are where there are no doctors or, you know, different things that are just reference material that I can use uh, in different situations. So, guys, number one, build you a library and then back it up with, um, you know, a thumb drive or something that you have all that information from a PDF. That is a wonderful idea. I wish I could give you more specifics, but um, uh, there's so many that are just, I don't really, I can't really recall someone in particular, but there are a number of them out there. Uh, Travis Bickle asks, what is a good brand of solar slash crank radio? Um, okay, I'll show you my favorite. <laughs> I'm going to go off camera here. This is one of the Midlands. Midland makes great. I mean, there are some others. Uh, there's Eaton, I think it is, and I've got a couple of those. One of the things I stay away from is any rubberized coating on the outside. That is really cool when you get it. I like it. And it's like, oh, I like this. It's soft. After a little bit of time, it breaks down and it gets super sticky. <laughs> and then it starts to get dirty looking. Uh, I have a couple of, I have a white one and it looks like, I don't know what. Uh, but this one has the solar panel on the front. And I think I tried to do this last week. Uh, and it has a battery, a crank right here. So I can crank this up. Uh, and it's a small compact. Looks good. Has a little handle. Has a flashlight. This is just excellent, especially for what we're talking about. And so this is something has an antenna. But something like this uh, that, again, make sure you get that hard body because if you don't. Uh, but there are a number of them out there, but the Midlands have been, Midlands been around for a long time. So I think this is a good option. And this is the, um, it's just Midland has weather radio on it. And I'm trying to see if it has a certain model number. I got this from um, a sportsman's guide, but check out Midland emergency radios. Uh, thoughts on permaculture gorilla gardening. Oh yeah. I mean, if you've got the, uh, the wherewithal, uh, a good friend of mine, well, actually, as um, SOE Gear, John um, Willis, he has an incredible system of um, hydroponics and a lot of different ways to be able to grow food in a small area. Uh, and that's one of the things that's, you know, it's really going to be important is to be able to. And then, of course, you know, with uh, uh putting, you know, using every available area that you have that you can grow gardens. I think it's a really great way to do it. Uh, my wife and I have been talking about it. We have a certain area where we have gardens, but we were just talking. We ought to have things going on all over the place. It's more natural. 
and it you know you can pick your fruits and vegetables the thing is and i'll just tell you this unless you have a way to secure it you're going to have a trouble with deer and rabbits and things like that the good thing is, is if they come around you're able to harvest some deer and rabbits but you want to keep the rats down so um that's one of the biggest things we've had a problem with and is, is keeping the deer out of our gardening until we had a wall around it and now we're, we're you know we're in a lot better shape but uh yeah there's a lot of different type methods and i don't see using just one i think using different type methods that actually uh, suit where you are and guys even if you live in an apartment you can own your if you have a little patio area or a little deck you can do some vegetables and just some different things even if it's just cherry tomatoes uh, those things, while but you won't be able to live off just that, it's going to supplement what you can find to make it even more healthy. Big proponent of making sure that you're doing some kind of gardening. Uh, Colorado Biker asks, what textbooks would you recommend to get now that reference for SHTF? Chemistry, physics, engineering, electrical. Well, there is one book called the Thomas Book of Reference. Uh, and actually, uh, Max Expedition, that's where I found it. Max Expedition had it. It was an excellent reference on all kind of stuff. It wasn't specific for SHTF. It was just regular. Uh, and that's the one that's the one book that I do know of that's like that. But it's Thomas Book of Reference, I believe it is. And I even had a compact version. It wasn't all that big and I could just open it up. But you can get a larger version. Uh, one thing that I would recommend that's not just about that is um, the SAS Survival Guide um, by, um, um, yeah. So the SAS Survival Guide, the Ultimate Survival Guide, that is an incredible book. And it has a ton of reference, even edibles, uh, natural edibles or wild edibles, uh, different ways to be able to treat things. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the SAS or SOS, no, OS, OSS, um, Ultimate Survival Guide. Uh, there's also a number of different books. And I'm going to tell you, when I'm reading, like going home, uh, the, the whole series, and there's a number of books, is while it's a story, there are so many different elements that come into play where he talks about, I did this, I did that, I did this, this happened. And uh, it really can help you to kind of well round and actually help you to think about things you weren't thinking about before. So um, there, there's some validity with those as well. But, um, you know, any reference books uh, that have just general information, I think, are going to be important. And some of them are going to be more uh, specified than others, more specific. But having that library. And the one thing about a library is it doesn't matter whether you have power or not. And so that's a bit. In fact, for me, when the power goes out, typically I'll pull out a book and read if I don't take a nap first. Um, R J J R ask, I had a question occurred to me the other day. How do you actually transfer silver and gold into a new currency if there is a collapse? Is it just for barter? How do you access that wealth? Well, you know, like when you go to uh, like this one store we have here, and they, they typically have them around, uh, it's called Upstate Gold, and they buy and sell gold and silver, and they'll take silver. Let's say you take your gold in there and you say, hey, I want you I want to I want you to buy this gold. And so you do it and then they send it to the refiner or they resell it and they give you the money. Uh, they can actually if we have this new currency, you know, they can transfer it into that currency. If it's the digital dollar, we're all sunk anyway. But, um, you know, going to I'll tell you something that's funny. You get on eBay. And there are people on there that are selling gold coins, silver coins, lots and different things. You know, if you want to turn it into a different form of currency, you can take it and sell it on there. And then they pay you electronically. So there are ways to be able to get around just going, OK, I'm stuck with this. You're not going to be stuck with it. A lot of times in um, it was funny years ago, I was at some estate auctions and sometimes in the states, people have stored up some silver and gold. And they would auction that off for the families and, you know, and bring a good price. Of course, you have to pay the auction fees. But there are ways to get around, um, you know, not just having to, to have this, you know, unicorn kind of thing. And you don't know how to how to do anything with it. The, a pawn shop even. Uh, 
So there's a number of, uh, and there are a lot of people, and I'm going to tell you, if things start to ramp up, there are going to be a lot of places that open up that are looking for gold and silver. We saw that back in 2008 when we had the huge economic meltdown. Stores actually opened up with signs in the window saying, we take silver. So there's going to be some ways. I go to the gun shows, flea markets, whatever, and I could, there's gold and silver there all the time. And, you know, a lot of times they'll, they're willing to pay for it. So there's, there's going to be ways to do it. So, all right, it's one o'clock. Wow. Okay. Well, guys, thanks. Great questions. We really appreciate you being here. Um, you know, these are some things just to think about, guys. If tomorrow you get up and the lights don't come on, the water's not running, what are you going to do? And you need to have a backup plan. Those are things that are vital to survival. Vital. So when you've got EMP possibility, when you've got cyber attacks that are happening all around, when you have actual, you know, threat of war or whatever's going on, or just a terrorist attack or some eco Nazi that's going around trying to, you know, shut down, uh, you know, all production, uh, this gives you a way to be able to survive. And the one thing about prepping, guys, and I've said this a number of times now, you can't prep enough. You, you can't prep enough. But what it will do is buy you time to be able to make other decisions and find other methods because things will get back to a new normal. So just hang in there. And again, Exotac, if you don't have a fire kit, get yourself a fire kit. You can get the matches. You can get the fire steels. You can get even a cover for your Zippo lighter or, or Bic lighter that really kind of protects it. Uh, there's a, They have a number of different type tools. And set that up and have you some tinder and guys if you need to start a fire again it cooks your water it cooks your water it boils your water cooks your food gives you heat light keeps predators away fire is essential and exotech gives a 20 percent off using suits 20 in the link down below in the description big thanks to sarah mack uh, for being here today and handling all the questions and hopefully we'll see robbie next week be strong be of good courage God bless America. Long live the Republic.